Hello and welcome to the answer key session part 1 where we will discuss stations 1 to 7. This is the answer keys for our anesthesiology OSCE 3.0 for August 2021. Okay, how do we use this OSCE anesthesia key? I will be discussing the salient points to be written on your OSCE answer sheets. OSCE requires targeted, crisp, precise answers. Of course, for academic interest, I will be discussing a few related topics as well. But uh, uh, mind you, it won't be an exhaustive or comprehensive discussion. Moving to the first station, this was regarding the entonox for labor analgesia. So the first sub question mentioned which anesthesia service utilizes this equipment. It is labor analgesia. The next sub question is about the new pack entonox valve. Do not get mesmerized by this manufacturers words. But yes, you should know that uh, the entonox the technique involves a demand valve. So first it consists of a first stage pressure regulator connected by a narrow bore delivery tube to the demand valve which has 22 male connector which is attached to the mouthpiece or face mask. The advantage is the tubing can be very long so entonox cylinder can be placed in a remotely from the demand valve in a warm area. As patient inspires through the mask or mouthpiece, the gas flows and ceases at the end of inspiration. Thus, the demand valve ensures that the gas does not flow unless negative pressure is achieved. Airtight seal between the mask and face are essential. Third part was about the peak inspiratory flow rate supported by the delivery apparatus. It supports in excess of 275 liters per minute and the fourth sub question was about the pointing effect. The pointing effect involves the dissolution of gaseous oxygen when bubbled through liquid nitrous oxide with vaporization of the liquid to form a gaseous oxygen nitrous oxide mixture. The pointing effect reduce, produces a 50-50 mixture which reduces the critical temperature of nitrous oxide. So, Entonox has a pseudo critical temperature of minus 6 degree Celsius. I have shown the picture of uh, John Henry Pointing, the English physicist and mathematician and inventor who is behind this uh, principle of mixing oxygen with nitrous oxide. A bit more information on Entonox. Entonox per se is the BOC trade name for the gas mixture. Entonox takes 30 seconds to act and continues for approximately 60 seconds after inhalation has ceased. For optimum effect, of effect uh, inhalation should start when the parturient feels a contraction and uh, it tightens to coordinate contraction tightens to coordinate the maximal effect with the central painful part of the contraction. So timing is important. You may be asked about the pseudo critical temperature also. The critical temperature of a gas is the maximum temperature at which the compression can cause liquefaction. Mixing gases may change their critical temperature as it happens with nitrous oxide oxygen mixture that is endonox. Moving to station 2. These are simple questions. Identify the breathing circuit that is Mapleson E. Coming to part B, the minute volume requirement for spontaneous ventilation. The original analysis of Mapleson E system suggested that a gas flow rate of two and a half to three times the minute ventilation was required to prevent rebreathing of expired gas. However, this assumed a square wave respiratory pattern and the investigations using a more realistic breathing pattern 
have suggested that one and a half to two times the minute volume is acceptable in spontaneously breathing patients. So the answer you need to put only one and a half to two times the minute ventilation. Coming to part three, how do you give uh, intermittent positive pressure ventilation using this Mapleson E or T piece? It can be performed by intermittently occluding the end of the reservoir tube. Part 4 is about the functions of the reservoir bag. Reservoir bag accommodates the fresh gas flow during exhalation phase and acts as a reservoir available for use in the next inspiration, especially to meet the peak inspiratory flow demands. It acts as a monitor of the patient's ventilatory system. It can be used to assist or control the ventilation. The back being the most distensible part of the breathing system, it protects the patient from excessive pressure in the system. Station 3 is all about automate. Okay, the first sub question is about four salient features. You need to write only the salient features. It's an ultra short acting, non barbiturate, hypnotic, intravenous anesthetic agent. Atomidate has a very favorable hemodynamic profile on induction with minimal amount of uh, hypotension making it an ideal choice for shock trauma, hypovolemic patients or for patients with significant cardiovascular disease. It is approved for use during induction of general anesthesia and rapid sequence in intubation as well as other indications where short term anesthesia is warranted. Next sub question is about the dose for induction of anesthesia 0.2 to 0.6 milligrams per kg of body weight do not forget to mention the route of administration intravenous. Part 3 was about the concern while using atomidate in septic patients. Septic patients have an increased risk of developing adrenal suppression which has been associated with increased mortality as indicated by some studies. Since atomidate affects cortisol production, its use in septic patients is controversial. However, data are still lacking to prove that atomidate should be avoided in this patient population. Contraindications 1. Hypersensitivity reaction Relative contraindication in sepsis Renal impairment Hepatic impairment. Moving to station 4 on reanimatology or resuscitation. The first sub question itself is a key pointer to the key skill in CPR, which is the most critical component of CPR. The answer is chest compression. Chest compression, not the airway maneuvers or intubation, it is chest compression. Clear? What are the indications for early defibrillation along with CPR in sudden cardiac arrest, ventricular fibrillation, pulseless ventricular tachycardia? That's all. Expand ROSC, return of spontaneous circulation. The ROSC algorithm is also very important when you come for a CPR uh, viva station or even in your uh, case discussion, it can be asked. Now, the important point I would like to stress here is about the targeted temperature management post cardiac arrest. Attentive control of the core temperature is important intervention for patients who achieve return of spontaneous circulation and are not awake. That is, they do not follow verbal commands. To help prevent neurological deterioration, a temperature between 33 and 36 degrees Celsius is typically targeted for comatose survivors and maintained for at least 24 to 48 hours before neuroprognostication. TTM may be used in pregnant or hemodynamically unstable patients and for those being treated with coronary catheterization or thrombolytics. What are the methods of induction of hypothermia? Three classes, 
conventional cooling techniques where we do a rapid infusion of 1 to 2 liters of ice cold that is 4 degrees Celsius crystalloid IV fluids or using ice packs. You can always use uh, also use the surface cooling systems which are blankets or pads wrapped around the patient that circulate cold air or fluid. The third category is core cooling systems where we use a central venous cannula to circulate the cold saline. The use of peritoneal lavage and extracorporeal circulation devices are also mentioned. They are expensive and it's not easy to assemble in a code blue scenario. Something about TTM2 trial which appeared in the recent NEJM journal. The question addressed was does targeting hypothermia that is 33 degrees Celsius improve the survival of out of hospital cardiac arrest patients over and above targeting a normothermia which is maintaining a temperature less than or equal to 37.5 degrees Celsius. 1850 comatose out of hospital cardiac arrest patients were recruited and uh, distributed among two different categories one for hypothermia 33 degrees Celsius TTM and the other category is normothermia less than or equal to 37.5 degrees Celsius TTM. Both groups uh, received sedation and normothermia were maintained for 40 hours in all patients and until 72 hours in sedated or comatose patients. Protocolized neurological prognostication was performed after 96 hours. So these were the findings. They found that death from any cause at 6 months modified Rankin scale score more than or equal to 4 at 6 months are comparable. Arrhythmia with hemodynamic compromise was also comparable between hypothermia group and normothermia group. And the conclusion they arrived was hypothermia did not lead to a lower six months incidence of death than normothermia. This was published in uh, NEJM 2021 June 17 issue. And the key practice points mentioned are target temperature of TTM following cardiac arrest could be 33 degrees Celsius 36 or less than or equal to 37.5 degrees Celsius. TTM requires close temperature monitoring pharmacotherapy and use of cooling devices, protocolization of the neuroprognostication decreases the likelihood of premature withdrawal of care. I brought this point into your attention for uh, uh, further improvement in our clinical practice and uh, we look forward to further publications in this regard. Station 5 a chest x-ray is shown and the diagnosis is uh, too obvious. You can easily pick up uh, the pneumothorax. The subsequent questions, sub questions were about the triangle of safety which was described in our chest x-ray interpretation video as well. The boundaries are uh, clearly labeled in the diagram shown here. You need to write the uh, boundaries and uh, the advantages of selecting triangle of safety for intercostal drain. In Next sub question was about the role of arterial blood gas analysis in pneumothorax. So let's be very clear ABG analysis does not replace physical diagnosis nor should treatment be delayed while awaiting results if symptomatic pneumothorax is suspected. However, ABG analysis may be useful in evaluating hypoxia and hypercarbia and respiratory acidosis. Okay. The last sub question was uh, name the one way valve which may expedite hospital discharge and be used during transport of an injured patient. Hemlich valve, the mechanism, the use, the purpose, the advantages all are mentioned in our chest x-ray interpretation uh, video. Moving to station 6, this is all about airway assessment. These sub questions deal with the malampati test, Wilson risk, some score and upper lip bite test. What is the importance of malampati test? It gives an idea of the relationship between the tongue size and mobility and size of the oral cavity. This relationship is important because it somewhat predicts how easily 
the tongue can be displaced by a laryngoscope blade during intubation. Second sub question was precisely on the modified melampathy class 3 where only soft palate is visible. You need not write the full story paragraph about this. Give the pointed answer. For your clarification, I have shown the picture. No need to draw the picture for OSCE unless you are asked for. So this picture will tell you what exactly is class 1, class 2, class 3 and class 4 of modified melampathy. Third sub question was about the components of Wilson risk sum score. The parts or the components or parameters of the uh, combined scoring system is very important. It can be asked during your case discussion, viva or even in the OSCE. So the parameters are weight, head and neck movement, jaw movement, receding mandible, buck teeth. They were given a score of 0, 1, 2 as indicated in the diagram and a sum of two or more predicts difficult intubation. Now the question is how it fares against other uh, uh, predicting modalities. So this is an article which appeared in uh, British Journal of Anesthesia comparison of malampathy and uh, Wilson risk uh, sum. So they concluded that the sensitivities of Wilson risk sum and malampathy classification were similar but poor. But uh, in view of significant intra-observer variation in performing melampathy classification, they preferred Wilson score in airway assessment. Yes, it is a multi-parametric um, assessment tool as well and easy to administer. An uh, article on this regard also appeared in Anesthesiology Journal after the publication of this particular article in BJA also. So I brought into your attention these articles in case you are asked about uh, this correlation between different airway assessment things. This is not asked during our this particular OSCE station, but this is just for your The part 4 of the question was about upper lip bite test. This is the scoring system. Score 1 means lower incisors bite above vermilion border of the upper lip. Score 2 means lower incisors bite vermilion border of the upper lip not beyond that. Uh, score 3 means unable to bite the upper lip. The diagram is shown for your information but the question is only about upper lip bite test. You need not draw the diagram unless you are asked for. Uh, the comparison of upper lip bite test with the modified melampathy classification is mentioned in an article in NSCC analgesia and the comparison table is given here for your kind consideration and reference. Coming to station 3, this is all about uh, epidural procedure. What are the boundaries of epidural space? I think every first year PG should be able to answer this if required with diagram also. Then name the commonly used needle to identify the epidural space. It is uh, as simple as our so these are the boundaries of the epidural space. When you are answering, you should have the um, anatomical structures in your mind. So it extends as cranially as until the fusion of the spinal and periosteal layers of dura mater at the foramen magnum. Caudally, inferiorly, it extends up to the sacrococcygeal membrane. In the diagram, you can see the anteriorly posterior longitudinal ligament, vertebral bodies and discs can be seen. Posteriorly comes our ligamentum flavum, capsule of the facet joints and laminae and laterally you can find the pedicles and inter intervertebral foramina. Now the sub question is about the management of accidental dural puncture. So uh, these are the options. You can convert the dural puncture thing, pass a catheter, spinal catheter and convert it into a continuous or uh, intermittent spinal anesthesia through this uh, rent in the dura. Intrathecal catheterization can be done or you can give one bolus uh, spinal anesthetic drug depending on the case and your expertise and the level of puncture. Remember the intrathecal catheter should not be left in place after unintentional dural puncture in the thoracic spine and if it happens to be in the lumbar region you retain the catheter 
it should be clearly labeled that uh, it is cited intrathecally your team subsequent teams should be properly endorsed and they should also be capable of maintaining the uh, epidural to spinal continuous spinal anesthesia management and maintaining the aseptic precautions until the catheter is removed. A third option would be placement of epidural catheter in another space try your luck in a higher space or a lower space depending on your uh, experience practice and confidence or institutional practice and less commonly abandoning the procedure itself is one of the options for accidental dural puncture remember the incidence of accidental dural puncture varies from different literature say is 0.19 to 3.6 percent advantages of inserting an intrathecal catheter following unintentional or accidental dural puncture it reduces the risk of repeat dural puncture because once failed you can fail in a subsequent space also so you can reduce the risk of that rapid onset of action and use for anesthesia if you have enough competence and familiarity and system to support it the incidence of post dural puncture headache was reduced but not significantly generally it is mentioned that the catheter should be left in place for at least uh, 48 hours for the uh, inflammatory fibrosis reaction to uh, set in and uh, seal the dural rent once you remove the catheter and the last one significantly reduce the risk of an epidural blood patch which is one of the options to tackle the uh, post dural puncture head the contents of epidural space may be asked during your viva it is fat dural sac spinal nerves the epidural venous plexus and vessels and connective tissue i'm not going to the details you can refer to this table so let's wind up for the time being this is the end of part one we have discussed stations one to seven the subsequent stations will be discussed in the subsequent videos which will be released along with this thank you for watching thank you again for your support it's me dr sanish signing off